classified military stories, it really doesn't get much better than this, does it? Well, my dear friends, it's time once again to sit back and relax with your favourite drink. And listen. Artillery versus Mythology My mother had arranged for one of my cousins to pick me up from the international airport in Manila during my last visit to the Philippines. Being Filipino myself, it seemed like every time I returned to visit my parents' native country, I am introduced to hundreds more cousins and relatives which I never knew I had. I'd never met this cousin, whom I'll call Juan, who came to pick me up on a warm, tropical evening. It was near midnight, but Manila was still alive with the lights and sounds and hustle and bustle of a crowded metro city. My cousin Juan, a slender young man sporting a military-style haircut, picked me up in an older model van and, after tossing my baggage in the back, we began the long and slow trip out of the city. I was on block leave from the army, having just returned from a deployment to the Middle East, and I came to the Philippines to relax and to get away from all things United States military. As we made our way slowly through the congested midnight streets, still filled with shoppers, vendors, tourists and partygoers, my cousin asked me what I'd do in the US Army. Uh, we had a good five-hour drive to where I'd be vacationing near the beaches. I told him that I served as a platoon sergeant in an artillery unit. I'm also known as the Chief of Smoke, or simply Smoke. Well, my cousin Juan got very excited to hear this. As it turns out, he was also an artillery crew member in the Philippine Army, and he anxiously invited me to visit his artillery unit before my vacation was over. Naturally, I accepted the invitation, as I was quite anxious to see my fellow Filipino 13 Bravos, that's the US Army designation of an artillery soldier, to see them in action. Yes, I came to the Philippines to get away from things that go boom really loudly, but I just couldn't pass this up. Towards the end of my vacation, my cousin Juan again picked me up, all dressed and looking tactic cool in his Philippine Army battle dress uniform, and took me to the base. I was very excited to see how the Filipino artillery units operated compared to the way we operated in the American artillery units. Well, for one, I noticed that the Filipino battle dress uniform was pretty modern, resembling our own American uniforms with a similar digitized camouflage pattern, much like the ones our US Marines wear. Their equipment loadout was also basically the same as ours, with modular, load-bearing vests of ammunition pouches, grenades, first aid kits, and water while their individual weapons ranged from 556 caliber M16s and M4 rifles, with the designated sharpshooters armed with the 762 caliber M14 rifles. All in all, I judged the individual Filipino artillery soldiers to be just as motivated, competent, and professional as the best soldiers that served in my unit. My only disappointment was with the old equipment that the Filipino artillerymen were using. Their main artillery gun was an old American M101, 105mm towed howitzer. Long retired from service with the United States Army, the M101 first saw service in 1941 and was now considered a museum piece by most of the Allied countries which used them. But the M101 howitzer still soldiered on with the Philippine military and, in fact, the artillery piece which many of these young soldiers operated were the same artillery pieces which their fathers had operated and their grandfathers operated before them. In addition, their methods of emplacement and laying the gun battery, that's setting up the firing unit then positioning the gun tubes to fire on the enemy, hadn't changed much since the 1960s. On average it took 15 to 20 minutes to get the unit into position and set up with artillery shells and ready to fire at the enemy. By contrast, the modern United States military, using sophisticated GPS, satellite and target acquisition systems, could set up, acquire the enemy target, fire and destroy the enemy, and leave the firing position in a fraction of that time. I was issued a Philippine military vest with body armor and a Kevlar helmet, and accompanied the unit to the field where they set up to fire a battery of four howitzers. Given the fact that they were issued ancient equipment and were using outdated fire procedures, the unit still performed admirably with what they had and were able to put steel on target as quickly and as accurately as was possible. 
The unit commander was an air assault qualified officer named Captain Kangles, who was justifiably pleased with his firing battery. From emplacement to rounds impacting on targets, the unit averaged only ten minutes. This was a remarkable feat given the equipment they had to work with. Later in the day, we returned from the field to the main base, where the unit cooks served the soldiers a meal of a curry made with goat, a soup made with noodles, and a type of Vienna sausage, oh, and a generous portion of rice. After lunch, the soldiers began the task of cleaning and doing maintenance on their howitzers. I took that time to walk around the huge concrete bay where the unit held their formations, and admired the many pictures, banners, and citations that the unit had earned which decorated the walls. One picture in particular caught my eye, and I had to do a double take to ensure that what I was seeing was real. The picture was taken inside that very bay, with six soldiers standing side by side in front of a wall. The soldier in the middle I recognized as being Captain Kangles, although at the time the picture was taken he was a lieutenant. My cousin Juan was standing to the far right. What was shocking was that Mounted on the wall above the six soldiers was a giant wing. The wing was colored dark gray, almost black, and seemed to be covered in coarse fur. The wing was withered, resembling that of a bat, only it extended beyond the six soldiers standing underneath it. Assuming that each of the soldiers took up two feet of standing space, I'd estimate that the bat-looking wing in the picture measured about 14 feet long. Not wanting to take any soldier away from their duties, I waited until later in the evening when the unit's first sergeant, First Sergeant Gompalas, and several other sergeants invited me and my cousin out for dinner and drinks at the base NCO club. Over a plate of grilled steak kebabs and a nice bourbon on the rocks, I asked First Sergeant Gompalas about the curious picture that I'd seen in the bay. To my surprise, they talked about how they acquired the wingers nonchalantly as one might describe their morning commute to work. This was the story that was related to me that night. Back when Captain Kangles was a lieutenant, the unit went out for about a week of training in one of the more remote islands in the southern part of the Philippines, where suspected insurgent fighters were said to be operating. It was a heavily forested area with several mountains and hills where almost anything could hide. The unit made a base camp in a clearing about two miles from the nearest village and began conducting artillery training, firing rounds into an uninhabited impact area which had previously been cut out of the dense jungle. On the fourth day of training, the village leader and several farmers came to the base camp and demanded to see Lieutenant Kangles. The village leader accused Kangles that his men had stolen several chickens and a goat from the village the night before, and demanded repayment. Immediately, Lieutenant Kangles formed his unit, and a thorough inspection was conducted. The unit first sergeant said that no soldier left the perimeter the previous night, and no evidence was found of the missing chickens or the goat. Despite this, Lieutenant Kangles gave the villagers as much rice and canned goods as they could carry as he didn't want any troubles with the local population, who could have been sympathetic to the rebel insurgents. However, late the next day, the village leader returned and again accused the soldiers of stealing. This time more goats and chickens were missing, with many chicken coops smashed. Lieutenant Kangles again protested the innocence of his soldiers, assuming that the village leader was just using that as an excuse to get more free food from them. However... Lieutenant Kangles agreed to send First Sergeant Gompalas and five other soldiers, including my cousin Juan, to the village to investigate. The six soldiers, along with the village leader, were loaded on two military trucks and driven back to the village. Once there, the soldiers could feel a tension in the air, and the village of roughly 200 inhabitants was clearly on edge. The First Sergeant radioed back to Lieutenant Kangles at the base camp, that indeed many chicken coops were smashed and that the pen which held goats was also destroyed. Lieutenant Kegels radio back, telling First Sergeant Gompalas that the perpetrators may be rebel insurgents, that they may be trying to make the villagers hateful of the soldiers. The captain warned the soldiers to be careful and watch for any signs of insurgent movement when, all of a sudden, a scream echoed throughout the village that alerted the soldiers. 
A young woman crying hysterically ran from a small home and into the arms of the village leader. It took a few moments to calm the young woman down as she screamed and pointed back at her house made of bamboo and thatch. In a native language, she cried over and over again. She's gone. She's gone. It took her. The young woman turned out to be the village leader's daughter, and the person missing was her newborn little girl. The Filipino soldiers raced to the rear of the hut to find a huge hole torn into the back of the thatch wall where the baby was apparently sleeping. On the ground, the soldiers found evidence of claw marks. Whatever had done this had done it only a few minutes before the soldiers had arrived. First Sergeant Gonpalas radioed back to the captain, explaining the situation as well as his intention to look for the baby. Lieutenant Kangles, cautious that it may be a trap to lure the soldiers into the forest, told them to stay put until more soldiers could arrive. However, Juan heard the sounds of a baby crying somewhere in the distance, seeming to come from deep in the forest. It was getting darker by that time, with only about an hour of daylight left. First Sergeant Gonpalas again radioed the lieutenant, pleading with him to allow them to search for the infant before it became too dark. This time, Lieutenant Kangles agreed, but ordered them to remain in constant contact with the base. The soldiers plunged into the forest, trying to follow the fading sounds of the infant. Since this was only a training mission, the soldiers were armed only with one magazine for their rifles, containing just five rounds. The faint sound of a crying baby was combined with the sound of giant wings flapping, which, at times, seemed to go silent as if whatever was flying had settled in the trees. To their northeast were steep hills, shrouded in dense vegetation, and to the west was a wide river which flowed from north to south. For a moment, the flapping noise and the rustle of tree branches seemed to be coming from the soldiers' east, meaning that whatever it was was headed towards the hills. The soldiers had already been running through thick and humid jungle for about a mile, scanning the treetops and listening for noise, but after a while, the flapping noises ceased and the jungle became quiet again. The soldiers stopped in the thick jungle, forming a perimeter, and listened. They were at the base of the hill. Three quarters of a mile to the west was the river. The soldiers were sweating and tired, having had to maneuver around the vegetation and fallen trees in their desperation to find the infant. Once again, it was Juan who heard the crying. Somewhere on the steep hill above them was the faint sound of a crying baby. As the sun crept lower and lower over the horizon, the soldiers began ascending the hill, grabbing roots, vines, and branches as they pulled themselves ever upwards. Though completely exhausted, the further up they climbed, the louder the cries of the baby were heard. They finally came to a somewhat level ground where the baby could be heard only a few dozen meters away, but they couldn't see her due to the incredibly thick vegetation. Suddenly, they were met with a sound like rushing water, and something monstrous with hideous black wings broke through the dense foliage. Huang got the best glimpse of the thing describing it as standing roughly five feet tall, with a face that looked to be a combination of an old hag and a bat. The thing looked somewhat human, with female features but with legs and feet like a bat's, and it was covered in dark fur. This was the only good look that the soldiers got of the entity, as the rest of them only saw a dark shadow as it passed overhead. Climbing over a small rise, the soldiers emerged into a small clearing to a shallow cave. Around the cave were the carcasses of half-eaten raw chickens and goats. Inside the cave, in what can only be described as a nest of straw, scrap cloth and dead foliage, lay a little baby girl. Her thin clothing was ripped, and she'd suffered several scratches and appeared too tired to even cry anymore. First Sergeant Gompalas immediately scooped up the baby girl in his arms, comforting her as she coughed and whimpered. All of a sudden... Shots were fired as the soldiers began firing down the hillside. First Sergeant Gompalas rushed over to see what his soldiers were shooting at. The thing was gliding downwards, away from the hill and towards the river. If it gets across the river, we won't be able to track it again, yelled Juan. The thing sat down on top of a thick strand of trees less than a mile away, 
apparently injured by the shots fired from the soldiers. First Sergeant Gompalas handed the baby over to Juan, then grabbed the radio from one of the other soldiers. Fire mission, fire mission, fire mission, he yelled back to the artillery base. One round, shell, high explosive, fuse, air burst. At this point, Lieutenant Kangles could have questioned First Sergeant Gompalas as to why they were firing outside of the designated impact area. He could also have questioned why they were firing an airburst, an artillery round timed to explode in the air. He did neither, trusting in the judgment of his combat experience first sergeant, and ordered his unit to execute the fire mission. Shout out, yelled Lieutenant Cagles into the radio as one M101 howitzer belched smoke and fire. Meanwhile, the thing was half walking, half crawling towards the deeper woods, flapping its wings again as if to try and fly. The soldiers up at the cave held their breath as the creature disappeared into the woods, followed by an explosion in the trees fifty feet above where the thing had vanished under the vegetation. Just as the last fading rays of sunlight dipped below the horizon, a dark shape emerged from under the smoke, a scream eerily human-sounding coming from it. The black shape attempted to flap its wings as it tried to cross the river. Instead, all that could be heard was a loud splash. As soon as the soldiers returned to the village, they quickly brought the baby girl back to the base camp, along with the village leader and the greatly relieved mother. The medics examined the baby girl and cleaned and bandaged her wounds. Despite being a bit dehydrated and scratched and bruised, the baby girl would make a full recovery. Lieutenant Kangles filed a report with the battalion command and assigned a squad of soldiers to watch over the village for a few days, but nothing more unusual occurred. Over the course of the next training period, soldiers returned to the village to help repair the damage to the chicken coops and the pens which held the goats. They also repaired the home of the baby girl, whom the soldiers nicknamed Lucky Star. The display of artillery gunnery by First Sergeant Gompalas was nothing short of spectacular, as hitting a moving target with just one round was amazing. Three days later, fishermen fishing the river found the wing washed up on the shore and brought it to the soldiers. The soldiers eventually brought the wing back to base and mounted it on the wall. The thing started to shrivel up and stink as it was exposed to constant daylight. So, a day and a half later, the soldiers took it down and burned it. And that was that. Still, the nonchalant way they described the incident fascinated me, as if this was just one aspect of life being a soldier in that part of the world. For their part, the Filipino soldiers were just as fascinated by my apparently nonchalant description of being surrounded by thousands of terrorist insurgents when I was on an isolated base in Iraq only a few months earlier. We Americans faced ISIS fighters, and the Filipino soldiers faced big, creepy Batwoman monsters. No big deal either way when you've got an artillery on your side. Unknown contact over the Tonkin Gulf. My heroes have always been those brave men and women who've actually gone out and been there and done that, and who overcame incredible odds to inspire the world. The young Jewish girl who hid with her family in an attic in Amsterdam and wrote in her diary about the horrors of Nazi socialist oppression before she was found and killed. The frightened young American soldier who climbed atop a burning American tank destroyer and single-handedly fought against an assault force of Hitler's best soldiers. The bold African-American doctor who gave his life in pursuit of his dream of racial equality in America. Those courageous first responders who gave their lives to save innocent lives during the 9-11 attacks. Oh, the little Afghan girl who was shot in the head by the Taliban because she wanted to go to school and survived to become a champion of the right of those little girls to go to school. These people are my heroes. Not the grotesquely overpaid athletes who chase balls around a sports field, or the Hollywood action stars who make millions of dollars shooting hundreds of bad guys in their movies, then preach to us about gun control. I know an elderly gentleman who comes into our local watering hole every once in a while and orders exactly three mugs of beer before he leaves. Although he's in his late seventies and hunched over with age, he is still rather tall and imposing. Despite his imposing size, 
He's quiet and reserved, never raises his voice, and is, in every respect, quite unremarkable. Then, one Saturday evening, this elderly, soft-spoken man came into the bar wearing a green t-shirt, bearing the screen-printed image of a U.S. Navy F-8 Crusader fighter jet. The big U.S. Navy air show was going on that weekend at Naval Air Station Oceana, showcasing the U.S. Navy and U.S. Air Force's latest and most modern fighter jets and attack bombers. The Navy was celebrating a hundred years of naval aviation, and vendors were selling t-shirts with images of various historical and modern U.S. Navy fighter planes. Ah, the Crusader was the U.S. Navy's first supersonic jet and was designed to be an air superiority fighter used to defend the naval fleet against enemy fighters. The F-8 Crusader fighter served as the U.S. Navy's primary air superiority fighter during the Cold War, and squadrons of F-8 Crusaders were extensively deployed with the U.S. Navy and U.S. Marines during the Vietnam War, where their kill record against the most advanced enemy communist fighters could not be matched. Though we have many advanced fighter aircraft, such as the Air Force F-22 Raptor and the Navy F-18 Super Hornet, my all-time favorite jet fighter is the F-8 Crusader, which was designed in the late 1950s. I took a seat next to the elderly gentleman and passed him a mug of beer, telling him that I really liked his shirt with the image of the F-8 Crusader. He smiled as he accepted the beer which I'd bought for him, Surprised that someone as young as I would recognize the old fighter jet. Yep, he said. It's been a while since I strapped into the old Crusader. I was a gunslinger. The slang term for an F-8 Crusader fighter pilot. From 1962 to 1972. and Did a few tours of Vietnam. I usually don't splurge on myself, so my wife bought this for me at the air show today. Whoa, I thought. Did this gentleman just say he piloted my favorite fighter jet of all time during an active wartime situation? I smiled, feeling truly honored to be in the presence of one of America's wartime heroes. Everyone knows you as Bud, I said. But what's your real name, sir? Ah, Sarge, he said. Bud was my old call sign. When Bud told me his real name... I paused. That name sounded familiar, but I really couldn't place it. Later that evening, I looked up his name on the internet and was pleasantly surprised and shocked. The old, unassuming, quiet gentleman that everyone only knew as Bud was not only an F-8 Crusader fighter pilot who served in Vietnam, he was also a MIG killer. In 1967, while on a mission somewhere over North Vietnam, he was attacked by communist enemy MiG-17 jet fighters. Now, at that time, the MiG-17 fighter was the absolute very best dogfighter that the communists had, and four of them attacked Bud. He held them off flying with extreme skill, and managed to blow one of the enemy fighters out of the sky using two Sidewinder air-to-air -air missiles. The rest of the enemy MiG-17s fled the area as quickly as possible, fearful of falling to Bud's Sidewinder missiles or his 20mm cannons. Now, one of my favorite quiet time hobbies is putting together and painting plastic model kits of various different fighter jets and armored vehicles. It was a relaxing hobby that I picked up when bad memories of Iraq and Afghanistan haunted me at night. I bought a plastic model kit of an F-8 Crusader fighter, which I built and then painted. To top it off, I found the distinctive squadron markings and aircraft identifiers of Bud's F-8 Crusader and essentially built a small-scale version of the actual fighter that he flew during the Vietnam War. Finally, I mounted the model jet on a wooden plaque, which I painted to look like the deck of the carrier that Bud had flown from. The next time I saw Bud at the bar, I presented him with his gift, and for the first time since I'd met him, I saw the old war hero smile. Is that my squadron? he said, placing the model carefully on the bar and looking over every detail of the fighter. Look at the tail number, sir, I said. That is your fighter. Bud pulled a pair of spectacles from his pocket and looked at the tail number, clapping his hands. <laughs> that was my tail number. He then looked at the number painted on the simulated deck of the aircraft carrier. 
Ah, number 31. The USS Bonhomme Richard. He sat for several seconds, smiling and nodding, memories of his service coming back to him. Ah, thank you for this, Sarge, he said. You are more than welcome, my friend, I responded. Thank you for your service. So, uh, your hobby is model kits, Bud said. After my time in war, my stress relief was painting. I had to stop after a few years, after my eyesight started to get bad. You know that guy Bob Ross also took up painting after his tour in Vietnam? Oof, I did not know that, I said. Oh, he seemed so calm and gentle that I could watch him for hours painting those almighty trees on his show, The Joy of Painting. Bud laughed. <laughs> in the military, Bob Ross was a real hard-ass. He was the mean senior sergeant who yelled a lot and punished guys who showed up late for work. When he left the military after serving twenty years, Bob Ross promised never to yell again and took up painting. Well, the rest, as they say, is history. That's an incredible story, Bud, I answered. Well, I'd love to see some of your work someday. Ah, sure, Sarge, Bud answered. But if you have any other models, I'd really like to see them. I've always wanted to go into building models, but well, my fingers are just too big to do any good detail work. Well, in fact, I'd converted my garage into a man cave with wall-to-wall -wall shelves of displays of military tanks and aircraft of every type and era. In addition, I had 80 different fighter aircraft hanging down and lining the tops of the wall. Other shelves contained historical books and references of military history and military equipment. In the middle of the floor were two overstuffed couches facing my large flat-screen television and racks of military-themed movies. And, of course, in the corner was a fully-stocked minibar that I had inherited from my father. My man cave was a virtual museum of American military history. I handed Bud a chilled pint of beer as I walked him into my man cave. He stopped at every diorama, studying each detail of every model, including models of US M1 tanks, M60 tanks, and even the Vietnam-era M48 tank, the F4 Phantom II fighters, F100 Super Sabre fighters, the World War II-era P-40 Warhawk fighters, and many, many more. Ah, this is almost overwhelming, Bud said, sitting down on one of the couches. Well, you can't take it all in at once. Well, you're welcome any time, Bud, I smiled. Hmm, said Bud, looking over at a display shelf on the far corner. On it, I had displays of science fiction models like Star Wars, Battlestar Galactica, Japanese anime, and models of the science fiction movies which were popular in the 50s and 60s. Bud stood up and walked to the shelf. Oh, I haven't seen that in decades, he said. Curious, I followed Bud to the shelf. Bud pointed to a diorama on the science fiction shelf. That's a plastic model I built of the supposed UFO that crash-landed in Roswell, I said thinking that Bud meant he saw an old 50s black-and-white science fiction movie that might have featured a UFO that looked like this. Yep, Bud said. Uh, it's pretty accurate, but the one I saw didn't have the big saucer-shaped transparent top. Still, it's pretty accurate. Um, I'm not sure what you mean, Bud, I said as I refreshed his pint of beer. <laughs> you actually saw this aircraft? Bud nodded still staring at the model of the UFO before walking back to the couch. Yeah, 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 yeah. It was a long time ago, but I still remember that there is actually a model of what we saw. It makes me think that me and Boulder really did see what we saw. I poured myself a bourbon on the rocks and sat on the opposite couch. Oh, please don't leave me hanging, bud. Did you also shoot down a UFO in Vietnam? Bud chuckled and sipped his beer. <laughs> Do you really want to know? Of course, I said. Bud looked straight forward, as if his mind was traveling back in time. Towards the end of 1967, our tour of duty on the bomb arm Richard was coming to a close. 
We conducted an airstrike against communist military facilities at Haipong Harbor, near Hanoi, and one of our A-4 Skyhawk strike fighters was shot down by a North Vietnamese surface-to-air missile. Uh, the A-4 Skyhawk pilot was ejected and uh, landed in an open rice paddy. Well, it was a race between our search and rescue guys and the communist militia to see who got to him first. We had two A-1 Sandys, slow-moving, propeller-driven fighters, and one jolly green giant helicopter flying towards our damn pilot to pick him up. I was flying top cover with my wingman, Walter, over the rescue teams, protect them from the enemy MiGs. Oh, the pilot on the ground was hunkered down behind a paddy filled with muddy water and reported that the communists had in place several machine gun positions inside the tree line of a hill several hundred meters away. He was taking fire from that enemy position. Now, the two Sandys and the Jolly Green Giant were still several minutes away, so I led Balder into a steep dive towards the enemy gun emplacements. The F.A. Crusader wasn't optimized as a bomber. It was a fighter, but we were still armed with 2,000-pound bombs. We came in low, flying over our down pilot and towards the enemy, and released our ordnance on the target. We pulled up as four massive explosions burst in the jungle behind us. We looked round and orbited over our down pilot as he reported that the enemy positions had gone silent. But there were still more communists approaching his position. Uh, we stayed on sight for several more minutes. But having expended our bombs, we only had our guns and air-to-air -air missiles which were not very effective in hitting ground targets. Soon, however... The Sandys and the Jolly Green Giant arrived on sight. I was almost bingo fuel, so I was ordered to return to the ship as two F-4 Phantom II fighters from the carrier Kitty Hawk took our spot as fighter air cover. Boulder and I were cruising at 20,000 feet, headed southeast, and went feet wet over the Gulf of Tonkin towards our ship, when we were suddenly vectored to change course due north towards an unidentified aerial contact traveling at high speed towards our fleet, around 40,000 feet. We changed course and headed towards the unidentified contact, thinking that the communists were extremely foolish to attempt to hit our ships with just a single aircraft. Oh, we opened throttle and rapidly gained altitude to meet the unidentified craft head-on. Our crusaders entered a cloud bank, and when we popped out of the clouds, there it was a silvery metallic saucer-shaped object, about a mile to our twelve o'clock high. The object was approaching the fleet at high speed, but when we saw it, it suddenly stopped in mid-air and just hovered. Border was flying a half mile off my left wing, and the object was between us as we zipped past it. Oh, that object was definitely solid, and definitely wasn't anything the Americans had in our infantry. It was about a hundred feet in diameter. The top half of the saucer was convex and had what looked like small rectangular portholes around the perimeter of the craft. The bottom of the saucer was relatively flat, with a small circular protrusion extending below it. It seemed to glow slightly, but I wasn't sure if it was self-generated or if its metallic surface was reflecting the sun. Boulder and I banked sharply and dived back down to get a better look at the thing. Well, to our amazement, the craft simply dropped straight down to 20,000 feet in a matter of seconds. We dived in a turning loop in an attempt to get behind the thing and broke through the clouds again. We caught up with the craft, which was several miles ahead of us and was still approaching the fleet again. I tried tracking it with my sidewinder missiles, but the craft would make these impossible moves which no human could survive. In one second, it would be directly in front of us, but... Once our sidewinders would start tracking, the craft would seem to jump a half mile left or right up, making it impossible for us to get a shot. Well, by this time, we'd close to where we could get a gunshot with our 20mm cannon. Well, you might be able to throw off a missile, but you couldn't fool bullets. I was closing to one mile off the craft with Boulder still to my left, when the craft zoomed 90 degrees to the right, and in a second was at least 10 miles away, before shooting straight up into the clouds. Boulder and I landed on the bonnie, a little more than fumes in our fuel tanks, and we quickly made our report to the CNC about our contact with the unknown craft. 
describing every detail we could about it. However, our main concern was for our downed American pilots still trapped inside North Vietnam. About an hour later, we learned that our pilot was distracted from that rice paddy and was on his way to Da Nang with a bullet in the leg. He was wounded but would survive, although the jolly green giant that pulled him out was shot up pretty bad. The two Sandys that were covering them also suffered damage from enemy ground fire. Uh, about a month later, Boulder and I were told that the aircraft we encountered was most likely the Soviet Union's newest high-speed fighter, the MiG-25 Foxbat, an aircraft which, as it turns out, looks absolutely nothing like the aircraft I saw. But the U.S. Navy Crusader fighter pilot and American war hero peacefully passed away a few months later in his sleep, surrounded by family friends and loved ones. I was also happy to see that a few former F-8 Crusader pilots were at his funeral, and the one thing that they could say about Bud, besides him being an awesome fighter pilot, was that he was the consummate practical joker. He could carry on a joke story for days. Well, I was tempted to ask them about Bud's UFO encounter, but decided against it. If he was having a laugh pulling my leg, then more power to him. I pray your war has ended. Every time I return from a deployment, I don't stay home for very long. I stay home just long enough to drop off my gear, say my hellos to friends and family, and then I have to leave again for about a month. Usually I'll fly to Germany, Hanover in particular, to blow off steam and decompress. Anyone who says that they've returned from serving in Iraq or Afghanistan and claims they don't need to blow off steam and decompress has never served in Iraq or Afghanistan. After my last tour of duty in Iraq, however, I decided to change things up a bit. Instead of flying to Hanover, I decided to take a trip to my family's native country of the Philippines. I don't know why, I guess it was just something different to do. My mother's family comes from a place in the northern Philippine island of Luzon called Baguio City. Those who have never been there, Baguio is a remarkable place. It's a city built high in the mountains and only four roads lead to and from the sprawling city, although during typhoon season only two roads lead to and from it, as the other two roads usually get washed out. Starting from sea level, it usually takes between 40 minutes to an hour to drive the narrow roads that oftentimes double back on themselves as each snakes around steep gorges, lush green rice terraces, in order to reach the city in the mountains. Well, amazingly, entire communities and villages are built into the size of the mountain, with houses, shops and farms literally constructed on top of each other. There's almost no flat place in Baguio City. A tourist will find that they are either walking up a crowded street or they're walking down a crowded street. The giant SM Mall, located in the bustling shopping district, is also unique in that you can walk in it at the ground floor, go up three stories and step off on the ground floor as the mall is built into the side of a mountain. Narrow streets jam-packed with buses, taxis, jeepneys and scooters go every which way in the city, leading up and down and around the various schools, restaurants, parks and markets. Ah, being so high in the mountains, the city of Baguio always enjoys relatively pleasant temperatures all year round, and when the rest of the Philippines is baking in the tropical heat of the summer, the moderate temperatures in Baguio has earned it the unofficial title of the Philippines' summer capital. But it also has its drawbacks as well, as almost every day during the afternoon between 2pm and 6pm, a visitor can expect it to rain. During typhoon season, the rains could last for days and days on end, leaving everything from the hardwood floors to the towels in your closet feeling cold and moist. My mother's family owns a rather tall house atop the tallest hill which overlooks the city. Her three-story, nine-bedroom home is built literally on the side of a cliff, with a narrow road running down the small driveway. Again, in this community, homes were built so close together that your next-door neighbour to your left could be in a house situated on ground ten feet above your house, or your neighbour to the right could be situated on ground twenty feet below you. On the top floor of my mother's home is a balcony, 
which gives one a breathtaking view of the entire city and surrounding countryside as well as the home of our neighbours, who live on a narrow cross street at least a hundred feet below us. I don't stand out on the balcony for long periods of time because I'm scared of heights and tend to get a touch of vertigo if I look out at the panorama for too long. And so it was at my mother's home on top of this hill, on top of this mountain, where I found myself after my last tour of Iraq, and boy did I need to decompress. Being trapped and surrounded by 12,000 screaming ISIS fighters and constantly being rocketed every day was no picnic. I had been napping in one of the upstairs bedrooms for most of the afternoon. It started raining at around 3pm and didn't start to peter off until around 7. I was feeling restless and closed in since there wasn't any reliable internet and there wasn't much in the way of channels to watch on television, as if I could understand what they were saying anyway. I was all alone in this big house with nothing to do. I threw on a pair of jeans and a black t-shirt that I bought from the PX at Camp Arjifan in Kuwait and stepped outside. To get to the street, you had to walk down a narrow flight of stone steps, then get on the second landing and walk down another flight of narrow stone steps which wound its way down to the driveway. There was a bright red metal gate which enclosed the driveway and opened directly into the narrow street in front of the house. Once outside the gate... I turn left to where the road literally drops another 50 feet to another road below. The angle of the road is so steep that vehicles don't so much drive down this road as fall to the street below. Well, like I said earlier, the houses, shops and little stalls on this hill were built very close to one another, and as it had turned out to be a clear and pleasant evening, I'd expected to see more people running about. But aside from a few stray cats and dogs and the occasional crowing of a family rooster, I appeared to be alone on the well-lit cobblestone streets. At the base of the hill was another crowded and bustling street. During the daytime, it was filled with automotive shops, marketplaces, restaurants, and places to purchase farming tools and equipment. However, at night, as if by magic, this is all replaced by lounges, karaoke bars, gentlemen's clubs, and places where people can dance and mingle. Feeling in the mood for a nice bourbon and live music, I decided to walk the mile and some change down the hill to one of the nicer lounges at the base. As I said, the streets were rather narrow, and the sidewalks, where there were sidewalks, were only about two feet wide. It was unusually quiet, and the air was still as I began walking down one of the narrow streets which led down to the main road, leading down the hill. I was enjoying the peace and tranquility of it all, and the fact that I didn't have to worry about incoming rocket attacks. I looked around and marvelled at how everything here seemed to look like it was frozen in time, and that everything looked exactly like it did when it was first built back before World War II. With the constant rains, lichen, moss, flowers and vines grew out of the stone retaining walls which lined the streets, as if they were a lost city somewhere deep in the Amazon rainforest. I was lost in thought and didn't even recognize that I was now at a portion of the road where the street lights were getting dim. It soon began to get misty, the results of the moist night air mixing with the warmer temperatures, and soon I couldn't see where I was stepping. I eventually came to a point where the winding road intersected with another main road. Well, I wasn't lost, but I also didn't quite know exactly where I was. I knew, however, that if I kept taking the road that went down, I was going in the right direction. I chose the road going to the right, which seemed to lead down off the hill, so I followed it for a few minutes. Soon a couple of taxi cabs appeared out of the mist and passed me going up the hill, so I knew that I was on the right track. I soon passed a beauty salon which was on the ground floor of a tall hotel called the Mountainside Inn. I seemed to recall that the lounge that I wanted to visit was behind this establishment, but further down the base of the hill. A very narrow side street led off the mountain road towards the direction of the lounge, but it was shrouded in darkness. Well, I could either continue on the main road, which would eventually lead to the street at the base of the hill, and then turn right and walk towards the lounge, or I could see if this dark, narrow street was actually a shortcut. I decided to go down the dark and narrow street to see where it led, because 
I was an American soldier, fresh from war, vacationing in a foreign land where I barely recognized any landmarks. So, yeah, no common sense. I walked in the middle of the street because the mist and fog were now all around me. I didn't want to step into a ditch or open drain which I knew lined the streets. The road wound down between the mountainside inn on the right and a low stone wall to my left and led downwards, so I knew I was still going in the right direction. But instead of turning left towards the main road at the base of the hill like I'd expected, the road went right, doubling back on itself and winding back up the hill. The houses next to me were pitch black and there were no working streetlights here as the mist seemed to swallow me in its embrace. Well, I thought about doubling back and walking to the main road, but, well, I wasn't in a hurry, really. Plus, this walk was kind of cool. In fact, it was getting cooler by the second. It was downright chilly. Just as I had the feeling that I wasn't alone on this dark stretch of road, an icy chill ran up my spine, and I could just barely see my shadow in front of me from a faint glow to my back. Thinking that a car was approaching behind me, I turned around to see a young lady in a white dress standing about ten feet from me. At first, I thought that the reason I could see her was because of the light from the moon, but I soon realized that she was the one who was actually glowing. Hmm, I thought. That's cool. I stared at her for a second. The air around her seemed to shimmer ever so slightly, so I couldn't see her in any exact detail. However, from the expression on her face, I could tell that this young lady was not happy to see me. With my knowledge of the traditional Filipino language somewhere between none and zero, I did the only thing that I could do. Hi, I said in English. The glowing young lady with the angry expression said nothing, but in my head I could hear Japanese. I... what? I said. How did you do that? You are a soldier. You are Japanese, came the angry voice in my head in an accusing tone. You are a Japanese soldier. I... well... yeah, but I'm only about a quarter Japanese. I'm mostly Filipino, and a little Spanish and Chinese if my mom is to be believed. Well, Grandma got around a lot, I guess. You are a Japanese soldier, she screamed in my head. You do not belong here. This is our land. Somewhere in her rage, I could also hear desperation and sadness. During the Japanese invasion of the Philippines in World War II, the Japanese had done some unspeakably cruel and violent things to the Filipino people. The Filipinos were subhuman in the eyes of the Japanese, and the Japanese soldiers often took pleasure in tossing Filipino babies into the air so they could try to impale them with their bayonets. In fact, the reason why I'm part Japanese was because a Japanese soldier had gotten my grandmother pregnant. My mother had told me stories of a young lady in a white dress that was savagely raped and brutally murdered by the Japanese. Her ghost was said to haunt these hills, guiding innocent travellers who may have gotten lost, and frightening evil men who had wicked intentions. I'm not afraid of you, miss. I'm not an evil man, and I have no wicked intentions. Japanese soldier, she hissed. Yes, I admitted. I am part Japanese, and yes, I am a soldier, but I'm an American soldier. I paused, wondering if she'd say anything. Well, she just stared at me, as if waiting. We fought side by side with you. We suffered with you. We bled and we died with you. And together we were defeated by the Japanese with you. But, well, the promise was fulfilled. We returned again and we threw out the Japanese soldiers. This land belongs to the Filipino people. I'm sorry for what happened to you, but I am not your enemy. I am an American soldier. The young lady regarded me for a second, then slowly turned away, seeming to take the mist with her. The air grew warmer and the streetlights flickered on as she slowly vanished. Go with God, I said as she finally faded from view. In my head I heard one last word. 
Salamat. Later on, I was relaxing and enjoying a nice bourbon on the rocks at the crowded Miles Club. I asked the friendly bartender what the word Salamat means. Wait, he laughed. You're Filipino and you don't know what Salamat means. Uh, humor me, I said. Salamat, said the bartender, is Filipino for thank you. Well, I hope you all enjoyed those two stories. Uh, more to come. At least one more video of uh, stories like this. And hopefully the author is going to provide a lot, lot more because I really enjoyed narrating those. A lot of fun, but a lot of intrigue and mystery too. Your thoughts, feelings and comments in the section below the video, <laughs> as always. I'll do my best to try and reply to some. Yeah, I always say that, don't I? But I really will try this time. Well, my dear friends, that is enough for me for one night. Um, if you didn't see my big new uh, collaboration with Unit 522 over on his channel, go check it out. I put it on the community chat uh, for you all to enjoy. That's enough though for a while, isn't it? See you again tomorrow night. Till then, very, very sweet dreams and bye bye. Thank you so much for choosing to spend your time listening to me. Now, if you enjoyed the Dr. Creepin experience, then come find me on Facebook. Come chat with me on Twitter. Listen to the background music and download it if you like on SoundCloud. Drop by the store, pick up a t-shirt. And, importantly, if you've got a story you'd like me to read, send it to Dr. Creepin's Vault, the subreddit I set up so that I could read your stories. Now, Looking forward to seeing you all again real soon, so come check me out, okay? <laughs>